started. Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Mary and I'm working at Brilliant Labs and I'll be your co-host today here with Pierre Paul, who is our cybersecurity specialist. Um, so feel free to introduce yourselves in the public chat. And I know we have a few classrooms that are gonna be joining us today as well. And let me introduce you to our guest speaker, Andy Ellis. Andy is a graduate from MIT. He's a former US Air Force officer and serves on the Harvard University's visiting committee to IT. He is the CEO and principal at the leadership development from firm Duha, and he is the operating partner at YL Ventures and an advisor to several cybersecurity startups. During his 20 plus years at the global uh, content delivery network um, Akamai, Andy led its information security organization from a single individual to a 90 plus person team. Uh, which over 40% of those are women. And he was behind the development of several of the core technologies behind its security solutions. So needless to say, Andy is a seasoned technology and business executive with expertise in security, managing risk and leading an inclusive culture. Take it away, Andy. Thanks, Mary, I really appreciate that. Uh, for those of you watching along, I'm gonna have my slides inside my video, so you can just maximize me. You don't have to worry about any other slides that are going on, because uh, that's where the talk's gonna be. So I'm gonna talk today about marginal risk and how people make decisions, and sometimes how bad decisions pile up. Uh, and we'll look at a couple of different things that have some things in common. So for instance, we have you know, the solar winds hack, we have the Colonial Pipeline, for those of you paying attention to petrol in the United States. We have cyberbullying, we have sextortion and blackmailing. And all of these have some things in common about the way that risk decisions are getting made. Uh, so to get started, we're gonna do a little party trick, get everybody engaged. And so what I'd like you to do is be verbal. Um, you don't have to turn your microphone. This is just so that you can you know, speak where you are. I'm going to ask you some questions, have you respond. If you're in a classroom, that's even better, where all of you get to, the, to say something. So just to practice it, everybody just say, hi, Andy. Hi, Andy. Look around, make sure you all, all know who we are. Now we're going to ask five questions as quickly as you can answer these questions. Go for it. So what color is snow? What color is snow? What color is snow? What color is snow? What do cows drink? Now I'm willing to guess that a number of you said milk. And what happened there is, you know, you're, you're primed to say white, 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 and then white cow beverage. Obviously milk is what you say. I'll explain what's happening in your brain in just a minute. We're gonna do two more of these. So second one, math problem. For those of you who thought you didn't have to do any math today, unfortunately that's not quite true. So. Taylor buys a baseball glove and a ball for $105. The glove cost $100 more than the ball. What did the ball cost? If you shouted out $2.50, you'd be accurate. If you shouted out $5, it means you probably weren't spending as much time in your brain and that's totally okay. That's what most human beings are going to do. Uh, in fact, the farther away you are from doing math problems regularly, the more likely you are to actually get this one wrong. I tend to find that adults fail at this far more than students do. And the last one, we're just gonna practice saying left and right. So you see this purple line and I'm gonna expand to make it bigger in just a moment. If a word appears on the left side of the line, I want you to say left. And if it appears on the right side of the line, I'd like you to say right. So we'll make that full screen again. Okay, so what just happened there? That's always a fascinating one to, to take a look at. So what happens is for most people, it's easier to think left and right by reading the words than by doing the discrimination of which side is your left and which side is your right. Uh, you know, especially if you might be reversed to people and left and right are a little bit, feel a little bit different. What's going on here is that a model of how humans make decisions and do things is often called the OODA model or observe, orient, decide, act. And in this model, you see something comes in, right? And you're gonna filter out to only pay attention to the things that matter. Uh, humans see millions of points of information every second, but our brains can only process 40 of them. So we've evolved to ignore the world. 
Uh, all animals do this, the more higher order animals uh, specialize in ignoring more, of, more and more of the world. Consider that when you're looking at things, it's easier for you to see motion than color in your peripheral vision because you know the color and distinguishing a shape doesn't matter as much as knowing something had happened. That's your eyes filtering information for you. Your brain filters information. If you're sitting down right now, you probably weren't thinking about how your chair felt underneath you until I started talking about it because it wasn't relevant. Then you have to orient this information you now have. You take all these data points that your brain thought mattered, and you're trying to put them together to understand how that fits in the world. Uh, for instance, if you're walking down the street and there's a car in the road, you know, if the car is in its lane, you can orient yourself and say, hey, that one's safe. If it's driving at the sidewalk, you might think, oh my goodness, I don't want to deal with that, and you're going to get out of the way. You've oriented yourself to there's a problem coming. Then, of course, you'll decide, and decisions are often made based on what we already know how to do. We've thought about a plan, and so we're going to repeat the plans that we have done in the past, and then we're going to act. And often acting is do the thing we already know how to do. Now, this is really expensive to do. It makes us you know, very good at a lot of decisions, but it's also really expensive with the muscle that spends the most calories in our body, which is our brain. And one human evolutionary advantage is that we learn not to think, which probably sounds an awful lot backwards, right? You're in school, the whole point is to teach you how to think. Well, the human brain wants to try not to think. It wants to short circuit this and go from observe to act. And so thought is happening, but not consciously. You're not thinking about your actions. There's just rules that your brain is creating to say, when this happens, let me do this. So when you were reading left and right, your brain said, ah, I don't have to think about left versus right. I can just read those words. And so that's what it was doing. That's why it was hard. When we had white and cow and drink, your brain quickly just pattern matched to say, ah, that's milk. And so that's a thing that often happens with humans. When we're making decisions, we're making decisions based on rules from the past. And so we want to ask ourselves and learn, you know, why do people make bad decisions? And when people say, when we say this, you know, people, someone makes a bad decision, and some of you have probably heard this from, you know, colleagues, fellow students, teachers, parents, siblings, you know, bad is a polite word. We say bad decisions because what we really mean and we're thinking inside our head is stupid. God, why was that person so stupid? Here in the United States, we have the concept of what's called Florida man, because it seems like every day in the news, there's somebody in Florida who did something so outrageous that everybody's like, how could anybody think that was a, a good plan? That, that, you know, you can make fun of them because we like to make fun of other people. It just sort of makes us feel good. We should recognize that because it's not a very nice attribute that a lot of humans have. So when you catch yourself thinking about stupid, what you should really recognize is that it's actually about incomprehensible decisions. We want to understand why are people making decisions that we think we wouldn't make if we were in their shoes. And being in their shoes is actually the hard problem. Because when we ask people, like, how do they think humans do it? Risk management, about deciding what risks are reasonable to take. You know, I've done a number of surveys on this, and I get back some adjectives that are not at all positive. Uh, and they range from, you know, good to, frankly, just awful. But here's an interesting thing about humans and risk management. We are the dominant species on our planet, which suggests that actually we are awesome at risk management. So now we have to understand, like, what is this thing? And if we really are awesome, what are the places where it might go wrong? So first, let's talk about risk, because risk is one of those words that everybody uses, and they mean a completely different thing every time they use it. Um, it reminds me much of a, a former Secretary of Defense of the United States who, when asked, like, the hardest part of his job, he said, communicating using the English language. Because if I tell somebody to go secure a building, if I tell the Marine Corps, you know, they're going to just kill everybody inside and blow up the building. But if I tell the Army, you know, they're going to make sure that there's, you know, a fence around the building and that there's a gatehouse and that there's a guard who has a password. And if you don't know the password, you can't get in. And the Navy has a really odd definition of secure, which is they turn off all the lights, they close and latch the windows, and they lock the door. So I have to be very careful. And so 
in that interest, let's define risk. So risk is about how much harm you expect to have in the future based on the current plan. Uh, you know, if you decide you're going to jump out of an airplane without a parachute, you have a really high amount of risk because you expect a lot of harm to happen when you hit the ground, unless you're jumping out of a plane that's sitting on the ground, in which case, probably not very risky. Now, it's hard to measure risk. There's so many variables in the world. It's a very complex system. And so it's often more about our perceived risk. How much risk do we think we have? And that's where we often get into trouble is when we don't understand all the ways it's going to hurt us. And risk isn't just one type of risk. There's a lot of different flavors of risk. Risk can be about reputation. You know, if I do this, uh, people will think badly of me. Uh, they're going to make fun of me. They don't want to be my friend anymore. Um, they're not going to trust me in the future when I make a suggestion. It can be about money. If I do this, I won't get paid. Um, I'm going to lose money if I'm gambling or something of that nature. Compliance is just a really nice fancy word for talking about you know, following the law and the rules. Um, what is the risk that you get caught breaking the rules and so you get in trouble for that? You go to jail, uh, you get set home. Uh, it can also just be about your strategy. Like you have a plan, there's some reward you want, and maybe you have risk that you just won't get that reward, you know, that your plan won't come through. And it always, always includes safety. You know, how safe am I both physically and emotionally? And what harm might come directly to me? In fact, often that's all people think about with risk and they forget about these other attributes. But these attributes are really important because we have to recognize that we have different tolerance for risk than other people. So this might be a person who has really high tolerance for getting caught breaking the law and a lot of tolerance for losing money. Maybe they don't have a lot of money, but you know, they don't have a very high tolerance for reputational harm. So to them, that's going to get, uh, they don't have a, a sort of a big envelope to push in and they're not willing to put themselves at risk and they really don't want to ever be wrong, right? Their plan needs to succeed. Um, and that actually can be a problem because once you're committed on that path, even if your plan starts to fail, you might stay on the path because you don't want to be caught failing. You know, someone else might have a completely different strategy where they're not worried about their risk and they're not worried, their reputational risk, but they're really worried about losing money. Uh, and so maybe they're going to take a lot of you know, sketchy choices to make money because they're not as worried about you know, the, the reputational hit or getting caught breaking the law or not following regulations. But let's pretend for a moment that risk has just one dimension so we can understand how humans make decisions here. And so you might think about it having this span from what's totally safe, like I'm not going to get hurt at all here, all the way out to what we call the Darwin Awards. Those of you who are not familiar with Darwin, uh, you have Charles Darwin, invented theory of evolution, and a Darwin Award is given to somebody who manages to kill themselves through their own foolish actions before having children so that they remove themselves from the gene pool. Um, and so you know, things that are so risky that they're doomed to failure, we'll call it sort of Darwin level risks. You know, most humans probably think they're right in the middle here. That look, I, I, I don't play it completely safe, or I don't play it completely safe, and I'm certainly not a crazy risk, but you know, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. But here's the reality. Almost all humans are not risk takers. You know, we, we push a little bit into a risky area, but we mostly play it safe. There's a lot of crazy risk out there that we don't even consider taking. Um, and that's okay. That's not actually a problem for us. We want to take just enough risk that good things can happen because we turn those risks into rewards. Um, but the risk category also doesn't look like this from a color perspective. Really, there's an awful lot of risk that is so dangerous. Most paths we never even think about. We, right, we only think about this place where there's a little bit of risk. Now, why does that matter? Because here's what we think that world looks like. Because we only think about risk in the margin. At that point where it's just dangerous, we think that's our whole world. In the same way that I, who live in Boston, tend to think that like Boston is the whole world. Um, and those of you up in Canada are probably like, yeah, no, Boston is just like this town somewhere in our, in our southern suburbs. Um, but that's all about where we spend our time thinking. Uh, and this here's where it's going to sort of come into play. Let's imagine that you could put numbers on this axis. And these are just made up numbers, so you don't have to remember them. And maybe, you know, from a scale of zero to one, 
you know, the boundary between things that are safe and things that we would think about is 0.09 or 9% of the way in. And th the boundary between what we're thinking about and things we would just never do is 0.11. Right, so it's this tiny 2% range that we're actually making decisions in. But we think the range is big. We think that that distance is actually 90% of the universe. Um, and now why does this matter? It matters because we make changes in our behavior based on perceived risk. So as we're going along and there is some level of risk in our world that we have and something pushes it up, some risky thing happens, we naturally are going to act to push it down. This is what's known as the Peltzman effect, named after Sam Peltzman, who was an economist at the University of Chicago. And Sam became really famous when he talked about killer seatbelts in the 1980s, when the United States was debating a nationwide seatbelt law. And he said, look, if you give people a seatbelt, you're gonna change their, their perceived risk. In fact, you're gonna push their perceived risk down and they're going to take action to make it more dangerous. And in fact, we sort of know that to be true. Uh, as we add safety systems to automobiles, people drive faster. In fact, the whole point of a safety system is often to enable us to go faster. Why do we put brakes on cars? While brakes stop cars, their purpose is to enable a car to go faster. The better the brakes you have, the faster you can drive. Sam Peltzman, uh, gained notoriety when he said the safety feature that would keep people from driving crazy and recklessly and killing pedestrians would be a simple spike on a steering wheel. Because nobody's going to drive more than five kilometers per hour if they risk you know, impaling themselves on their steering wheel if they have to come to a sudden stop, and therefore it will be safer for all of the pedestrians around them. So why that matters is when we're sort of in this world where there's this unsafe thing and it becomes a little bit safer to our perception, so it just sort of moves on this spectrum a little bit, it changes color from a thing we're not gonna do to a thing that we're willing to do. At least we hope that's the case. But sometimes what happens is it goes the other direction. It's a thing that we're doing, and then it becomes a little bit unsafe, and now we should probably stop doing it. But remember when I talked about reputation risk and strategy risk and how people don't want to be proven wrong? A lot of people, once they've decided that they're doing a thing, don't want to have to change their mind. And so what happens is as it moves that little bit to them, remember they're on this scale where, that feels much, much larger. And so you're going to justify to yourself an incremental choice to take that risk and push it back into something safe. Maybe you take a small change to make it a little bit safer. Maybe instead you convince yourself it wasn't as dangerous as it was. Uh, and so you're just going to move back to where it is. And so this becomes what I think of as little bad decisions that pile up. So let's take the colonial pipeline since that's been in the news, right? And so what happened here is, you know, a pipeline system which transports gasoline, you know, all across the United States. This one mostly services the, the Northeast. It has what are called SCADA systems that are you know, system controllers that operate all throughout its pipeline that are then connected to normal PCs. And those normal PCs normally are inside you know, some their network, but then they're connected to the internet in one fashion or another. We haven't gotten all the details on Colonial Pipeline yet, but they didn't maintain their systems. And they didn't maintain their systems and they didn't have problems with that maintenance that they could see. And so it became easy for them to continue justifying deferring maintenance and putting in place security controls. Uh, as a result, they ended up in a place where at some point, somebody you know, attacks them, their systems get shut down, and we don't have any gasoline here in New England. Uh, solar winds is sort of a similar but even more complex one where a series of bad decisions they may be not bad, you know, because I said earlier, we shouldn't say bad, because uh, I, I can comprehend them. People were saving money, outsourcing some work, maybe taking shortcuts in doing so, but it wasn't until all of a sudden we had this systemic risk where one attack takes out or compromises 400 of the 500 largest companies on the planet that that becomes really a noticeable problem. Well, those are really big things about companies. Let's look at something smaller and how this might apply to you. So let's take a blackmail. So let's say you take a picture that you're, you're embarrassed about. You wouldn't want your family to see it. 
um, and you share it with a friend. And maybe that friend has a different reputational risk than you do. And then the friend shares it with somebody else. Right? That's probably not your friend at this point, just to be very clear. Um, and now you have a problem. Or maybe they say, well, if you, I'm going to share it unless you do something for me. Right? They start to extort you. They're blackmailing you. And so you had this bad decision to take this picture that you're embarrassed about. But now you have to convince yourself that the, the, the decision you made is still good. And so rather than saying, look, I took this decision, you know, let me just go tell the people that are about to see the picture that it exists, you'll do more things to hide that. Cyberbullying relies on a similar thing, where you have somebody who is the target of being bullied, and they're afraid to come out and say, hey, I'm being bullied and I don't like this. Uh, and it, you know, they get bullied once, and it works, and then they get bullied again, and the people who are the bullies get a little bit of a, of a fix off it, right? They feel really good. But the people who are being bullied are trying to have to convince themselves with decisions that keep piling up that it's okay not to go tell someone. Um, and often that's like the best defense against almost any plan, right? Things that make you more safe are almost always gonna be talking to someone you know and trust about a surprising situation even an uncomfortable situation. When you find yourself there and say, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't feel right, you know, being able to talk to somebody is always helpful. Uh, also recognize that when you're hanging out with somebody who has a very different risk profile to you, that can be dangerous because they're willing to do things that you're not willing to do. Uh, we see this in corporate world all the time. When you have somebody who works for someone who is less ethical than them, they become very uncomfortable because this less ethical person is putting them in danger with the choices that they're going to make. Some specific things that make you less safe, very tactical one. Any picture you take on your phone is forever, right? You take that picture, it ends up in the cloud, you're gonna share it with somebody. If you don't ever want that picture to be public, don't take it. It's my simplest recommendation. If you only walked away with one thing today, that's the thing I'm gonna want you to walk away with. But once you have done something, if someone's threatening you with embarrassment, and it will embarrass you, and that's very realistic, you'll be embarrassed, don't ever do something because you'd be embarrassed with the consequence. Right? Just take the consequence sometimes because you don't want to pile up even more embarrassing things. So that takes me through the brief quick section of let's talk about risk and decision making. Now we're really excited to take questions from within the crowd. So you know, I'm not sure how we curate those, Mary and Pierre Paul. So I'll let you tell me. Well, I do know that um, we have a few that were sent to us ahead of time um, that Excellent. Pierre Paul has. Um, so, and we will also um, answer in real time if anyone wants to chime in um, on the public chat, uh, they can do that as well. Um, so, Pierre Paul, did you want to read the first question? Sure. Um, I actually have one um, that is not in the question. I was just um, listening to you and there's something really interesting. Um, you were talking about, you know, a car coming in and, you know, you see the car and then always driving on the sidewalk and you need to take a decision. But um, how can we evaluate risk in cyberspace? Like if we can't see, like we don't know, like, where the others are, we are pretty much anonymous. Um, so how can we evaluate risk? So that is problem? actually one of the hardest things to do is first of all, recognize that any sufficiently complex system looks like a simple system from the outside, but it's gonna be far more complicated than you imagine. That is a riff on Arthur C. Clarke's famous quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and so, in some ways, what you have to look at is, right, first of all, always ask somebody. If you don't understand a system, feel free to ask somebody else. But question, you know, is this too good to be true? Who is, who's making money off this transaction? So if you're getting something for free, then the other entity has some value that they get out of giving you this service. So when you think about social media, every social media company is actually a targeted advertising company they're getting value out of being able to sell targeted ads that come after you, being able to understand what you're doing. And so if you're not comfortable with them knowing what you're doing, you should consider like how much information you're willing to share. Uh, the challenge often is sometimes like, you know, 
I didn't even know who the Colonial Gas Company was a week ago. And now it turns out that their security choices meant I couldn't get gasoline this week. So at some point, this is where we do rely on government regulation to help us with wise regulation. We don't just want regulation for its own sake, but we would like the regulators in some of these industries to help ensure that we're doing, those industries are doing the right thing to help keep us as consumers who are far away from a choice safe. Thanks. Um, I don't know, Mary, if you want to ask another one, but I have a couple here. Um, maybe if someone else has some, go ahead in the chat. Um, why is it that some people decide to hack? Like, so I think there's, there's a lot of different reasons for why people uh, will engage in a criminal behavior. Let's recognize that hacking can mean lots of different things. It can also just mean somebody who likes to take a system apart. Like if you've ever taken a toy apart just for the fun of learning how it works, that's hacking. Like that can be good. It can also be bad if you're taking apart somebody else's toy. Sometimes people do it because there is a thrill in gaining knowledge. Uh, some people do it for money. They're interested in getting money, and this is the easiest way to do so. They have found a business that allows them to profit off of you know, somebody else's problems. Uh, and we see that both in the criminal world and we see it in the business world, right? There are legal ways to profit off people's problems uh, that also happen. So you know, similar you know, reasons why someone might do it. We do also see people who hack for ideological reasons. They are, are a political actor. They might be an activist who is protesting against a nation state. They might be a nation state attacking a different nation state. So all of those can be motivations for why somebody engages in hacking behaviors. So with the news that we saw last week about the pipeline, so this is true. Yeah. Like we, we can actually hack a pipeline. Yeah. So what happened, and so, you know, what happened here, we're still, we're hearing conflicting stories as to whether the pipeline was hacked or whether the pipeline company accidentally shut down its own pipeline. Um, and I'll give you an example of something similar that happened many years ago. There was a self-propagating worm called Slammer. And how Slammer would work is there was literally, you could send one packet to a specific type of server. It was the MS SQL servers, uh, and you could compromise the server and download it onto it, a copy of the worm, and then it could turn and scan and look for more things and copy them. And it was propagating all over the internet. It was taking down networks. And there was a bank in the United States that had this propagating on its network and said, well, we'll just block all traffic to that type of a server. And so they did. They put in place network firewalls that said, don't let any traffic to that kind of a server pass around our network. Unfortunately, that was the type of server that the ATM network used for that bank. So that company shut down its own ATM network by accident. It wasn't even that they made the conscious choice to do so, and they might have. It might have been a reasonable conscious choice, but it was a surprise. And so everybody said, oh, you know, Slammer took out this banking network. So we're hearing one of the stories I have heard that people said is, oh, in cleaning up their own systems, they shut themselves down. I've also heard that the ransomware did shut down the system specifically. So I think we'll have to wait a few days to know which story is true. But absolutely, there are physical control systems that are affectable by computers that have been compromised. And how ransomware works, which is the attack used in this case, is once you compromise the machine, you encrypt all of the data on the machine. And then you refuse to unencrypt the machine until the person pays a ransom for it. That's why it's called ransomware. And it's a very common tactic uh, that people use to target usually small and medium businesses. But in this case, they got somebody a little bit bigger. I'll just ask, uh, wait for someone who's just writing in the chat. Thanks, Andy. This is really interesting. Um, so would you say that, um, Awareness is maybe like a big, big part of of, um, of risk management also, like especially in cybersecurity. Like how can we make cybersecurity more accessible to um, to kids? So I think there's, there's two components to it. And so one of it is about an awareness of risks and just being able to sort of critically think about consequences. To say, well, if this happened, what would be the next effect? And so when you can do that, you are able to say, well, if this system broke, it would be really bad. Um, you know, if, if you have a car that's really, you know, and cars these days aren't cars anymore. 
their networks of computers that happen to be able to drive themselves around. And as soon as I described it that way, you might think, wow, if something happens to um, the computer that controls the brakes while I'm driving 70 miles an hour, that's a problem, right? That's that skill right there, just to be able to critically think about the consequences of failures is essential to cybersecurity and to doing awareness. And then the second thing is just the, the skill of learning how a system works rather than saying, oh, I have this computer in front of me and Andy's face is appearing and his voice is showing up. Start to ask yourself, what's going on here? Like, how is this whole network working? Because once you understand how the network works, then you can start to say, oh, I understand now a consequence of a piece of that network going bad. So those are, I think, the two skills. And notice neither of those said security in them. Like there are specific security skills, but the core skill really is about system deconstruction and consequence awareness. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from uh, McIntyre family. Uh, Rachel, my daughter is wondering, uh, what can she do to uh, work in cybersecurity? Are there university classes? So absolutely, there are classes uh, focused on cybersecurity. There are also classes focused in computer architecture. And so if you want to be a technical cybersecurity expert, you, know, you want to you know, work on building better computer systems, I'd recommend you know, focusing on computer engineering and computer architecture. Uh, if you want to be somebody who learns how to break into systems, focus on learning how to administer computers and then taking classes and doing that. There are often boot camps and workshops uh, to get even better at that. But a lot of jobs in cybersecurity aren't even deep technical. It's important to know some things. But we talked about you know, these little decisions that go wrong. So we have entire disciplines around you know, what we call comp the compliance world where you have you know, 100 control objectives that you want to make sure that you meet and you just have to go keep track of all of those. That's a safety engineering discipline. But you know who's really good at that? Librarians, because they're used to keeping track of large volumes of information, uh, making sure that their catalog is up to date. So in my last job, we would actually hire librarians to do that job. We would teach them basic cybersecurity skills. Uh, so it's worth recognizing that if you have these, this ability to deconstruct a system and think about what might go wrong, there are plenty of job skill sets that you might have and be passionate about that then apply to the cybersecurity world. Thank you so much, Andy. We have a really good one here. Uh, how do you teach the skills of cybersecurity but balance the ethical side of possibly giving students the skills to do some of the problematic behavior you mentioned? I, so I love this question. Um, I think that, that there's a couple different ways to address this one, but this one is really important. First of all, skills are almost always neutral. They don't have valence about being good or bad. They are just skills. Uh, the same skills that I can use for cybersecurity, I can do good and bad things with. Same thing with chemistry. Like I can use chemistry to do some great things and I can build bombs. Uh, same with physics, I can build bigger bombs with physics. Um, so recognize that it's about the, how you use the tool, which means it's about the human at the other side of it. Sometimes it's about making sure that they have better choices. If we teach people these skills and then don't give them opportunities for jobs, and so they say, oh, I can't work, but I could use this skill to go make money illegally, well, they're more likely to do it. Most people don't want to commit crimes, uh, but it's just the option that happens to be available to them. And so you're teaching that. At the same time, or, or making those opportunities available to them. At the same time, teaching them to see who's on the other side of this transaction. One of the biggest harms the internet has is we don't get to interact with humans very often. We interact with these light caricatures and we don't think about the hurts that we might cause as we do things. You know, for instance, as I've been here, I've been trying to just you know, think about, you know, I say miles per hour sometimes and kilometers per hour sometimes to at least acknowledge that, you know, I'm in the US and we use a different measuring system um, than other people on the planet use and I should at least reach out to the humans on the other side. But it's very easy to not even make that connection. And so when you think about like hacking into a computer system, think about the consequence. Like what if that computer system is in a hospital and is controlling a life support device, keeping a COVID patient alive? And you, know, you just cause it to reboot. Well, you might have killed somebody. And that's a really extreme consequence, just to be very clear. Like this is it's why we always pull out the extreme ones. Um, but just you know, pay attention and teach people 
to recognize the value of other human beings just intrinsically as humans. On that topic, uh, other than technical skills related to scripting, tools, networks, what would be one of the most important soft skills for good cybersecurity specialists? This is from Mr. Galan's class. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galan's class. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I don't like to think of them as soft skills. Um, I actually think technical skills are soft. Um, we call them hard skills because they're easy to measure um, and they're actually easy to learn. You know, it's much harder to learn than how to script and write a computer program, how to work with other human beings. People skills are a massive challenge, and, but they're really powerful because with technical skills, you can alter the world. Like your willpower changes the world around you. With people skills, your willpower can change another human being and get them to change the world for you. That scales much better. Even more important, and especially in the cybersecurity world, are what we call process skills, which is the ability to create processes that will sustainably continue to change the world. Uh, many of you probably have processes that you do every day that you don't even really think about. You, know, you may take attendance, right? Think of that as a process skill, you know, rather than relying on the teacher to just look around the classroom and be like, oh yeah, I know who all my students are. You have a process that keeps track of who all the students are and whether or not they're here. So if we thought about the safety goal of knowing where our students are, um, you know, which one would you rather have? The great teacher who just knows them all on site and we trust will never for miss a student or the process that ensures we know where all of our students are. Thank you, Andy. I think we have time for another one. Um, I was reading on your website something really interesting uh, where you said um, um, 40 Correct me if I'm wrong, but 40% of the, the, the crew that you were with was women. Yep. Um, what has been a big stepping stone in getting more women into careers in cybersecurity? So I wouldn't say there's just one thing. There's a, a number of different things that, go, that happen there. One piece of that is on the responsibility of the employer, and one is actually on the responsibility of the candidate. Um, and so if you're a woman who wants to get into cybersecurity, First of all, recognize that it's a hard career field. It's a hard career field for men too. This isn't saying it's, it's uniquely hard, but you have to decide you want it and make your way uh, and recognize that at some points you'll, you'll see a job posting that has 70 requirements on it. Just to be clear, nobody satisfies 70 requirements. Single biggest thing we did was try to take down those barriers. But if you're an employer who's hiring, you know, it's on you to make sure that everybody who works for you is somebody that you're invested in, not just the people that come to mind when you think there's a problem that are an opportunity that, they, that someone could go after. And I think that's one of the single biggest things we did differently is we just said, hey, let's, let's keep track of all of our employees. What opportunities are they ready for? Because we found that you know, men were more often the ones who would either volunteer or be suggested when there was a challenge, even when there was an equally competent woman nearby. And so by, by giving them both those opportunities, you know, where appropriate for them, we demonstrated we were invested in their careers. We promoted more, we retained them, showed that we cared about them. And that's, I think, really critical from an employment perspective is the retention. And from the employee perspective is looking for those managers that are going to invest in you and that recognize that they don't own you. And when you go into the, the career field, recognize that you are the person who owns you. Your employer never does. And so if you have an employer who's uninterested in investing in you, recognize that they just think that they're buying your skills for a little while, uh, but they're not interested in helping you get better. Thank you very much. Is there uh, maybe a last question in the chat? Is that moment where we all hope that Avery is typing yeah. an awesome question. <laughs> We're almost there. Um, nonetheless, it's it's a really really interesting topic. Um, it's um, so often uh, we we often like forget about risk, uh, especially in cybersecurity. We tend to do um, like you said, uh, take action. We never think about it, and uh, it's a good. Um, Good way to think about it, that's for yeah, sure. And, and for those who do want to learn more, the B-Sides conference series 
uh, which happens in countries all and cities all over the planet. I know that besides Halifax is actually a, a pretty good one. I think there's a couple others uh, across the, the various provinces. Um, and you can find them at securitybsides.org. Um, and you know, you'll find you know, lists of all of the different conferences. You know, go find a local conference. You know, almost every city has small conferences that will have hands-on practitioners teaching you what they've learned. And many of the B-sides ones at least are all free. Uh, and many other conferences are, and it gives you an idea that you sample something without committing. So you don't have to say, I'm going to take a six month course, go to a conference, see if there's something there that excites you and then go learn more about it. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, everyone. A special thank to uh, our colleague, Alicia, who first uh, uh, connect with you, I think. So thank you so much, Alicia. Um, thank you, Mary and everyone. And, uh, have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic day. Thank you so much, Andy. It was really great meeting you.